Hello, and welcome to the ESG Experience Podcast brought to you by Conservus ESG. I'm Healy Lev, Conservus ESG's Chief Revenue Officer. And I'm Ryan Nelson, Conservus ESG's CEO, and we're your hosts for today's episode. Whether you're an ESG expert or just dipping your toes into the ESG universe to understand how it can help with engaging stakeholders, mitigating risk, and attracting investors, or doing what's right, this podcast is for you. Together, we will navigate the alphabet soup of ESG, discuss ideas, sometimes controversial, review strategies, and share industry news and trends. In today's episode, we are very pleased and honored to be joined by Urvashi Bhatnagar, a healthcare executive expert and, in my book, most impressively, pun intended, an author. Ravashi is a healthcare executive whose career spans clinical care, research, advocacy, strategy, and operations consulting for leading healthcare organizations. As a mission-driven population health and sustainability expert, she has over a decade of healthcare leadership experience working with clients to advance health outcomes in underserved communities, leveraging advanced analytics and strategy to address barriers to care and advancing health equity. Ravashi holds an MBA from Yale University, no small feat, and a doctorate of physical therapy from the Boston University. Wow. Woo! She believes, Brian, are you going to keep up? No. You, okay. I, I'll try and participate in this conversation with you two, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. We'll let you, we'll, we'll, um, we'll talk in layman's terms. Much appreciated. Um, she believes global wellness can be achieved through sustained and intentional investment in products and processes designed to be inherently sustainable. Agreed. And capturing value from the triple bottom line advantages that sustainability offers. Um, and so excited to hear more about this book that you co-authored with Paul Anastas, um, The Sustainability Scorecard, How to Implement and Profit from Unexpected Solutions. So welcome. Hello. Hi. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you. And um, it is exciting to talk to an author. Uh, I have talked to a couple, and I understand it is quite the... Um, I don't know, sometimes grueling process and can be very, very difficult to, to put those ideas on paper. So um, congratulations again on on getting through that. And, and uh, we'd love to just tell us a little bit more about the book, Sustainability Scorecard, and uh, how the tool is differentiated from others. Uh, how does it work? Yeah. No, well, thank you, first of all. And, uh, you know, it's just a lot of sitting in a closet sized room, death by edits. Um, mm. I'm joking. Um, it's uh, <laughs> so many brilliant researchers and practitioners work informs a book, um, and especially this one. So I'm really grateful that I was able to bring this material to life. Um, but yeah, the sustainability scorecard is about um, going beyond compliance, essentially. And so it's saying uh, we hear from executives, business leaders, innovators um, that, you know, we want to create change for the next generation. We want a more sustainable economy. However, we don't know what's going to work. We do, what is the roadmap? What, what are the actionable steps we can take to implement sustainability um, and incorporate it, it into our corporate strategy? And so that's exactly what we dive into in this book. Um, it's essentially a how-to guide. Um, and if I had to uh, sometimes I say it's an it's a how to guide on how not to greenwash. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, we look at uh, we borrow from the principles, 12 principles of green chemistry that were created by Paul and are widely accepted in the research community. Um, and there's just so much innovation that occurs by way of leveraging uh, these 12 principles. And they're really focused on creating inherently sustainable products and processes. And so there's so much that the business community can learn from these scientific principles. And so we've distilled them into management frameworks uh, that will help the introduction and scaling of sustainable products. Yeah, it's very cool. I was looking at the at the 12 principles. I have not read the book yet. Uh, I, it's right up my alley and I, and I will, um, but I haven't yet. Um, but I was looking at the principles and and some of it, and it's interesting. It's it's principles of green chemistry. It was very specific, almost not not too specific, but about like manufacturing or chemistry and that sort of thing. And you've translated that into management processes. And that, is that accurate that you've taken those, yeah, made them a little absolutely. bit broader? Yep. 
And so, yeah, uh, green chemistry or green anything, I would say, has traditionally been con considered a really niche subject area, topic, even business practice. And so similarly in chemistry, uh, previously it was considered a niche subject area. Um, and Paul and Asis, along with John Werner, uh, sort of distilled the principles for creating green products um, into these 12 principles, uh, but they are used just widely for innovation now, and it's a really big field. Um, and if you think about it, everything we touch and feel is atoms. Everything is made of material inputs. And therefore, even though it appears like it is a small segment of a hard science, or it, it, it's a small segment of our business practices, it actually has a really widespread impact um, on innovation, on operations, uh, corporate strategy. And so that was the impetus for um, translating science into management principles, uh, because I felt that we, that we are a framework rich or scorecard rich um, uh, we live in a scorecard rich environment, but I felt that there was a dearth of material that was backed by research. And so this is why we created that, the, the scorecard. Right. That's cool. And, um, I like how you said, you know, go beyond greenwashing. I think I'd like to think, you know, the world business, most companies are beyond greenwashing. Like we all know that's bad and there's enough, um, re scrutiny, whether it comes from regulators or it just comes from consumers or even your own employees who live under the roof and know all the secrets, the trade secrets. Um, but the next step of like actually being able to tactically incorporate or do stuff, right? So you have a lot of companies that talk a big game or put out big goals. And oftentimes it's just a disconnect from, you know, someone in the C-suites like, yeah, net zero by 2050 sounds good to me. And then right. we often work with are the people downstream that are tasked with actually tactically doing that. So achieving that goal. And they do have to break it down, um, not just to be a box checkers and scorecard compliant, but to actually do things to, to right. attain these goals, whatever they are. So I love that you guys are looking at that way because that is really the trend that I'm seeing. We're beyond greenwashing for sure. Um, and we're starting to get beyond box checking and compliance to actually doing something. Uh, <laughs> so the fact that you guys are helping do that is great. So say um, I am a firm and I want to incorporate ESG strategy uh, into my corporation beyond compliance and disclosure. Say I've mastered that, which not yep. everyone has, but say I'm, I'm good to go. That's business as usual. We do it. Um, what's next? What do I do? Yeah. Um, wow. There's so much to do, but I'll, I'll uh, break it down into two, maybe two high level categories. Um, so one is the organizational side of things where um when you're looking at how uh it's really important to have the top-down messaging uh all of these claims and these targets that are announced by ceos and executives are really important but when when you're getting into the how of it it can seem really muddy there's so much data to sift through there's so much to do and so we advocate for building a steering committee that sits um within the CEO's agenda. And that actually prevents sustainability from getting siloed. It doesn't become something that is owned by cost accountants. It uh, isn't then only a messaging tactic for marketing. Um, it's not only compliance and just a legal disclosure. Um, when it is under the CEO's agenda led by our steering committee, it's backed by their buy-in, their messaging, um, and it kind of spurs action from every level of the organization. So that's one thing that we advocate for. And then the second is actually for that steering committee to um, build a working group that can evaluate the business units and the service lines within their organization and look at the areas where they can produce initial wins. And so what are some of the quick wins we can get? What are some of the business cases that would prove, you know, uh, to generate momentum if they were proven successful? Um, and and how can we just get some early wins, essentially, whether they're revenue, whether they are employee goodwill and things like that. And so those are some of those are some of the activities we recommend doing initially is to outline 
what are the areas where we can innovate and realize some early wins. And once we have revenue generated out of those activities, whether you have increased market penetration, you have built customer loyalty, whatever, whatever it is that you do, um, you can move forward after that and tackle you know, the harder issues by taking those revenues and then investing them into the next business case or use case. But we essentially uh, advocate for a stepwise process to create that transformation throughout the organization. It totally makes sense. And it is absolutely in line with what I'm seeing. So I've been in ESG, formerly called sustainability for all 20 years of my career. Okay. And I really have seen in the last two years, like you said, it's coming from the boardroom, not from some side team over here that's trying to grassroots do an initiative. Um, and it's often the cross-functional team you're talking about that touch all areas of the business in their respective disciplines, right? So you can't ever have one specific person. They can spearhead the whole thing, but they need to involve HR and they need to involve manufacturing and they need to involve all the business units who are specialists in their own discipline so that the thing gets done properly and it's really has tentacles all over the organization. So starting to finally see that which is really encouraging and then the last piece that you mentioned it has to be tied somehow into meaningful roi whether that's increased revenue market penetration whatever it is reduced costs whatever it is but nobody is doing this still just for the altruistic reasons like there has to be some tie back to a business case um so i'm happy i'm happy to say that in practice i'm seeing it all come together what you're pushing in concept but really still only by the industry leaders like it's still definitely not the vast majority just yet so we have some work to do to keep doing we're doing the right thing just keep going well and when i Absolutely. gather your ravashi your your concept is that i think that inherently you, these processes will be better. If you have this lens of sustainability and you have these concepts that you will build a better product or a better process, or it, it, you will be more successful. Is, does, that, does that sound right? Absolutely. I mean, that's absolutely the premise. Uh, so essentially what we say is sustainable. I mean, just to reiterate your previous statement, um, it shouldn't be something that's coming from the side. It, really needs to be if you're thinking about an innovation or a product development process it should just be another line magnet it should just be another design constraint something we're designing uh out or in um depending on you know what you're trying to create if it's an externality or side effect of materials that you're trying to design out or you're trying to design sustainability in in some way as a product spec um but in the design phase is essentially when, as you know, that's when the budget is allocated. That's when we should be thinking about the entire life cycle of that product. And, you know, including when it leaves even the consumer's hands when they're done with using mm -hmm. that product. Um, and, you know, whether it's going to end up in a landfill and when it ends up in a landfill, is going to degrade safely or um, is it going to, you know, pollute the groundwater? Will it be recovered? Can we mine this in some way? Uh, things like that. So um that's by the way one of my like um favorite if you will like but in a bad way like whatever the word is infamous like for favorite like my bad yeah. favorite is that um if you think about the cradle to cradle like that end of life cycle how just no one gives an f about where it goes at the end like they might start talking about sustainably sourced materials maybe 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 but at the end of the day no one cares that that thing has nowhere to go you can't donate it anywhere if it goes into a landfill it's gonna like pollute like that is still, um, to me, like one of the biggest problems is just the end of life and the lack of not even planning, just the lack of like giving an F about it. Like no one cares. I'm going to design my product. I'm going to make my money. I'm going to greenwash it to market it. Oh, it's going to end up wherever it's going to end up, NMP. So that's like. Um, Somebody yeah. cares. Come on now. We're, no one cares. We care. But, but so isn't it crazy, though, that like people don't care? Because think about like the opportunity. Over it, in that area, like to mine, for example, if you even think about the chip shortage, and if you could, if we were actually building collection mechanisms to collect uh, chips or component yeah. parts and things like that, I mean, that's you know, uh, there are distribution channels that can be born of that, and that there's a huge cost avoidance uh, factor to this. Yeah, so much waste, but you know, again, the money has to be there for someone to actually put a meaningful effort at it, and maybe that the unit economics just aren't there yet, but. Um, it's so troubling. And I think one of the places that I had the epiphany or it hit me really hard. So Ravash, you mentioned you have a one-year-old. My kids are a little bit older. Start going to all these birthday parties, okay? Minus the pandemic where no one did anything. 
and every birthday party you go to. So every kid going to every birthday party, every weekend, all over the country, all over the world, just come home with this goodie bag of plastic garbage, like cheaply manufactured, probably shipped a carbon footprint. Incredible. came from China. They play with it for 37 seconds. And then I'm left with it and I sit there and I look at it and I'm like, I, I feel guilty putting this in a garbage can. I don't want to put this in the garbage can. I didn't even want it in the first place. They don't even want it. No one wants it. And I'm stuck with this burden and, and eventually I throw it away and then I hang my head in shame. But it's like, it's such a, um, you know, a small example, like think of like much larger waste, like, um, but it, that's like, it hurts. It's, it's so not worth yeah. it. Someone is making, you know, money on, on the manufacturing of that product and they just don't care. So, yeah. I totally agree. And we get into it a little bit in the book, but we talk about performance. And so like there's this myth, and I think that's what you're alluding to, which is there's this myth that, you know, sustainable products um, perform poor for a higher price point. But then we think yeah. about what is performance. And we've been just taught to think that performance is effectiveness. Um, but if you think about performance as effectiveness that it's going to be at par or superior to a traditional product but it's also socially responsible it's also environmentally responsible all of a sudden you discover that actually 90 percent of the products that we use on a daily basis are actually poorly performing and you know because we if have it it in all of these externalities that you talked about because they're ultimately going to end up in a landfill really close to my house uh, and end up in the groundwater and I'm going to have microplastics in my blood that, you know, I'm just ignoring. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what's happening. I mean, programs like this and um, these kind of conversations, I think it's a business cultural change and we are putting a lot of pressure on the responsibility in the cradle to cradle concepts. So now when someone's designing a process, then people are starting to go, oh, but actually go a little bit further and you go, Oh, that's right. We're supposed to look at the whole thing now. I mean, it's it, yeah. at least we're having that conversation and shifting the culture where it stopped here, but now it should stop here yeah. sort of thing. So I think that's, I hope, I hope that's the that's next great. big thing we see. Well, my, my answer to it was I always, I took my own. Um, I said, I can return this to the people that made it. I feel like I just have that right. Ah. So like if I have a pizza ah. box, yeah, I'm like, I'm done with this pizza box. It's not, I, I'm going to walk it back over. Here's your pizza box. So like, well, we don't want used pizza box. I'm like, you gave this to me. I'm You've done with done it. That? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My neighborhood pizza shop. God. I'm like, I'm done with it. They're like, well, we don't really know how to use that. I'm like, yeah, but you have to deal with it. You know, that that was the point. I handled the that thing. That is awesome. Inside it. It's gone, but this box is coming back. And then you like show face there again? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, um, no, in no, the, I don't get city, wrong. I love the concept. In the just... city, that stuff's considered cute and clever. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you make uh, friends that way. <laughs> you know what this needs to be? Like, you need, I, we need to make like a social media movement out of this because you know how there's consumer demand yeah. for like the next green, like cosmetic or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, or some, you know, some clean makeup. We sure. need like consumers saying, I don't want this trash. I, yeah. I totally agree. As much as I'm poking fun at him, because I just imagine Ryan going back with the greasy pizza box being like, it's yours. And this poor, like $15 an hour employee being like, I don't know what you're like. I don't want your garbage, but you're right. That's what that we get. Have a movement of people that just bring the empty shit back. Sorry. And then, oh, Chris, and then, to bleep that. <laughs> and then they have to figure out what to do with it. That's the point. And, like, and then yeah. what they'll do is they'll do something innovative. No, like, they won't. They'll throw it away inside. Well, but eventually they'll say, we got to start designing containers that they can rinse down the sink and, you know, this happen, or they automatically buy the pizza after a boxes week or are so. piled up. Like this has to yeah. be a critical mass situation. Exactly, that kid yeah. for sure just threw away your pizza box and cursed you. Right. Yeah, that didn't. I doubt that that fixed it. Um, but if we just did that, you know, in yeah. a viral, viral way, just started returning do it. containers to, to, to the creators. Well, no, that's yeah. I'm not to prolong the discussion, but oh my god, I have a friend um, and was previously my professor at uh, at Yale, uh, Zoe Chance, who studies influence. But she has this wonderful talk on how to make behaviors addictive, and uh, gives the example of the ALS ice bucket challenge and the what? multiple, you know, like behavioral nudges and like things that. Uh, 
made that challenge so successful and go viral mm -hmm. yeah. uh, because it really speaks to human nature and how we respond to certain nudges. I mean, I'm sure there's an opportunity here to create a movement. I, Wait, it, so what was it, the secret? It, how did the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge take off? Like what in, in um, summary? Oh my gosh, I, I I think I listened to it a few years ago. Um, yeah. So I don't Just remember. I, I would butcher her brilliance. Okay, talk. okay. Yeah. And we'll have to, I'll pin it for an aside to have a listen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, every time I've come up with something that I thought deservedly should go viral it hasn't <laughs> so there's more to it than just me like thinking it's Deciding pretty funny or clever yeah, yeah there's sure. more there's more to it or sometimes i do see things that have like four million views and i'm like, like that uh, is so yeah why that yeah. yeah um no but I, I like it let's do something cool like that so you talked about a lot of frameworks and scoring mechanisms and all that but um i imagine there is one here how can the sustainability scorecard help firms innovate and dive deeper considering social and environmental bottom line we talked about some of that is there a scoring i know people are competitive uh what's the kind of feedback they get from the from the scorecard we've gotten some great feedback from the scorecard and we there's a few examples we write about um but I mean, there's just hundreds and hundreds of firms that are leveraging this methodology but i'll give a few examples so um, there's a firm called Airco Vodka that uh, produces carbon negative vodka. It's the world's first carbon negative vodka. Mm. Um, and P2 Science creates benign by design chemicals that um, are used in cosmetics and hair care and things like that. And they actually perform superior to traditional products. They're at a very comparable price point, um, but they're, you know, they're, they, they have really minimal side effects at best for human beings and the environment. And essentially what they're doing is that they're, they're leveraging green chemistry in their product design, but they're also like it from a material standpoint, but they're also leveraging the four principles of sustainability management, like waste prevention, maximizing efficiency and performance, and sort of expanding that definition of performance to include effectiveness, social good environmental good um using renewable inputs and ensuring safe degradation and that speaks to that last part where if it has to end up in a landfill then let's degrade it safely and thinking so so when we design products and scale it this way um we end up producing some really innovative uh products and processes that's cool yeah i would like to see that vodka for example take off the way that it, um what was the one that became trendy because like one celebrity drank it but it wasn't that good and now everybody drinks it that's way younger than you the name of it i um, i don't remember those or something but anyways the whole point i remember hearing about it the vodka itself wasn't awesome but mm -hmm. um the the proper celebrity endorsed it and almost immediately it just became like the vodka of choice like if it used to be in my day Grey Goose and Soda immediately was, I, I want to say it's Tito's. It can't be Tito's then. And also, <laughs> let's not throw them under the bus. Okay, let's not. But anyway, <laughs> um, I feel like you need to get the proper strategy because if, the if like you said, it's all things equal or even better in some cases for the beauty product or the vodka or whatever it is, then maybe all it's missing is um, the marketing or something. Because Absolutely. It's so logical. It's so yeah. logical. Um, yeah. And then I would like to see too, because I think so much of regulation plays a big part, um, you know, to force the the late adopters or the naysayers, um, but to make sure that people adhere to that. So, say like I start this sustainable um, net negative impact vodka, but then um, six years in, uh, new leadership, and someone approaches me and says, "Hey, I could cut eighty percent off your packaging costs if you use this thing or something," and then maybe it loses its integrity somewhere down the line. But that wasn't the brand equity that people were buying into. So, like, there's so much more. There's so much more evolution of maturity that has to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I was speaking with someone the other day. They asked, you know, where can I find this list of sustainable products or people and firms that yeah. have leveraged this methodology? And I said, you know, there's uh, if you Google the Presidential Green Chemistry Awards, um, the winners of that uh, award every year in four categories have been published since 1996. And I was just thinking we had this whole discussion on how even something like collating a database of firms that are doing the right thing right um, or are 
really close to it. Um, we don't even have that. And so uh, yeah. the landscape is just littered with opportunity. Yeah. And you say like the firms that are doing the right thing right, but by whose count? Like usually their own, right? Like nobody's right. going in there exactly. to make sure that the green shampoo is really, you know, you kind of trust the marketing, the branding, you trust the promise, you trust that someone in there is doing it, but we don't know for sure. But to Ryan's right. point before, the first step is just like awareness of, I used to design, you know, my product from this stage to this stage. Now I know I should even think about this stage. Like that's maybe where we're at. Like we're not yeah. Well, and to that yeah. point, um, we have to deal with green and rainbow washing. Um, how do we combat that? Wait, for our um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of listeners, explain rainbow washing because I myself only learned about that this past June. Or do you want me to explain it? Because I just uh, about it. Who wants to give an example of, well, I'll give one. Uh, maybe I, I'm sure you have a more uh, complete explanation, but there is some critique, and actually I have opinions about this, but there's some critique, like if Walmart all of a sudden in June decides to sell, you know, all of a sudden a new t-shirt with a rainbow on it pops up or whatever. Is that rainbow washing? Are they using this, uh, using pride to increase sales without a connection of authenticity to, you know, behind the message or something like yeah. that. So that'd be one example that you might argue is rainbow washing or literally putting a sticker of a rainbow on something in June, hoping that it will sell more. Yeah, no, that's literally the definition or like um, LinkedIn was the place I noticed it most. Like everyone changed their LinkedIn company logo or not everyone, of course, but a lot, um, you know, to show that they were celebrating pride, but then they might still have unethical practices or uninclusive practices within their organizations or maybe ones that don't align with look at my big prominent rainbow logo because it's cool to do it this month. Or maybe the marketing team is socially aligned and they did it or something, but the rest of the organization does not follow. So. Um, I, like I said, I learn new things every day. I learned that this past June. Yeah, I actually, I must admit, I learned it this past June as well. And I actually oh, read about this on your website. Um, Me I, too. I, Me too. Yeah. For real. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I thought it was brilliant. And I thought that it really spoke to like vulnerable populations as a whole. Um, and uh marginalized communities i mean if you need a special interest group you're probably not part of the majority you know and when we think about uh our externalities of our economic processes who does it really affect so you know i i think there's a statistic that um uh, forgetting I'm, I'm forgetting exactly what it is but i think it's something like 80 percent of the world's population uh uses farms and otherwise six percent of the world's population uses farms and otherwise manages 80 percent of the world's uh land surface area and so this is that's just an exam i mean that that's not related to pride but it's an example of um vulnerable populations that are that have this huge burden um of managing most of our natural resources and managing mm -hmm farming and land and that kind of thing and so and these are the populations that are exposed or affected by most harshly the externalities so when you talk about our groundwater and chemicals and toxins and things like that um more uh people with greater access people with greater means are usually not as affected by by all of these side effects as those populations yeah and I wonder too, like, um, you know, you could say it's cold hearted capitalism, but like, what's going to make people care? Like your example before of whatever this thing I'm throwing away that I needed to buy that had this packaging is ultimately going into the groundwater near my house that I'm going to drink. It's like, how do you get people to acknowledge that or care enough about it? It's they just the disconnect is still too much. Like, I don't yeah. think that people are seeing it that way or they're not paying attention to it that far or they don't care because getting sick from poisoned groundwater will take many years. Right. So, Urvashi, I think you answered this. Um, I'm going to read this answer back to you that I, I found, I think, on your LinkedIn, that, that exact question. And but then maybe you uh, you guys can expand on it. It says that you recognize that global total wellness, which seems like an awesomely 
uh, ambitious, but you know, very, very cool thing. Global total wellness can only occur by way of sustained, systematic, and intentional investment in social and environmental determinants of health. Can you break that down? Oh, yes. A little this bit. This is my favorite subject. How okay. much time do we have? Okay, we've got <laughs> a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, essentially. So, uh, my focus in healthcare is really on population health. And Popula for for those that uh, may not know, because this is such a like a, this is a sort of a technical term within the healthcare industry, and it's something it, it's a whole competency and area of study. Uh, but um, it's essentially looking at populations. It's a combination of public health data, um, analytics, uh, behavioral data, um, your healthcare provider data to really understand. Um, you know, population subsets, their risk factors, and understand their journey. W what are their outcomes likely going to be with certain disease factors or with certain comorbidities? And how can we affect a change? And so when we think about, you know, traditional fee for service systems, imagine someone has diabetes, they go to the doctor and they are prescribed a medication for that. That's considered fee for service. You come in, you are treated for a condition and then you leave. But when we think about value-based care, we are really looking at the whole person and we're incentivized by way of our financial contracts to look at the whole person and prevent them from coming back to the hospital mm -hmm. to be readmitted or to come back in the first place. So if you can prevent um, if you can prevent diseases or if you can manage diseases up front um, or create behavior change for lifestyle modifications and things like that, um, you can really reduce the total cost of care. And the healthcare industry has recognized that for a while now, but we are really making big strides. And so what I advocate for is looking at the social and environmental determinants of health. And there's a lot of work going on in health equity now. There's a lot of work in social determinants of health where we recognize that, you know, the social factors that an individual is exposed to really impacts their outcomes. It's not mm -hmm. just their one-time visit with the doctor and whether they're compliant with their medication. Yeah. And so we recognize that, but I push that further to say, let's look at your environment. Let's look at, you know, what, you're exposed to on a daily basis. And if we have a more robust picture of that person, or as a payer would call it, a member 360, a 360 degree view of what you are affected by, what you're exposed to, we can better manage your outcomes and we can potentially prevent you from having certain conditions. And so that's- And your uh, work around this is very uh, data-driven and analytical, is that, is that right? Really Absolutely. Yeah. It's very analytical. Um, uh, well, I I mean, digital and analytics just uh, has such a large role to play in everything we do now. But um, but yeah, we uh, this field in particular is really informed by analytics, looking at uh, trends and micro trends and understanding how we can um, better predict outcomes, better affect outcomes. What can be upfront to the patient so that you know, they, the impact of that disease is mitigated, things like that. Uh, Urvashi, I am fired up about that as well. So we'll have to continue that chat sometime. But to me, um, you know, the biggest discrepancy I see, it's like the difference between Western and Eastern medicine. I've like in the last several years switched um, because it's, it's, you know, to dumb down everything you just said, it's like the Western philosophy is you come to the doctor with an ailment, here's a pill, um, treat the symptoms, go away versus like the Eastern approach of like, well, what are you eating and where are you sleeping and what might have been the root cause of this symptom? Let's figure that out and fix that likely in one of your environmental, um, you know, from exposure or something. Uh, and then the symptom will go away by itself because you've actually fixed the root problem instead of just throwing a pill at the symptom. So um, as, if the trend moves moves more towards catching on to that, it will delight me. Um, but yeah, well, let's talk more about that. Absolutely. Well, um, yes, we will do that. Um, thank you very much for all the wonderful stories uh, and insights that you shared today. Oh, I did have one more thing. No, I'm going to steal, though. Do you guys know um, the etymology of the word Adam? 
Adam, I like don't. Because you, um, you mentioned Adams earlier, um, but and someone might have to correct me. We'll put it in the show notes. But um, I think it has something to do with like smallest divisible thing. Like there's nothing that can be, you know, it's something to to that effect. Smallest thing that can be divided. Where, like you said, because it goes into everything. So we need some way to describe that smallest thing. But anyway. Uh, I just wanted to show off on that one. Well, what's the etymology? Isn't that etymology like the word Adam? Why it's called the like, Y A T O M? I don't know what etymology means. Oh well, that you're you're supposed to break down why the word uh, Adam. I meant, um, but that it's like Latin for smallest divisible thing. Oh well, there you go. Like okay, so then you are that is etymology. But I was afraid to say Latin because it might not be Latin; it might be something else. But like Greek or something. Yes. So we don't know, <laughs> but we do have to play uh, this game, Urvashi. Um, with all the important discussion we have, we want to bring a little um, brevity to it as well. So, uh, and we can't disappoint the listeners. Uh, this game is called Beans or Beer, and all you have to do is is guess if it's beans or beer. The problem is, I, I I'm making it trickier this time. There's three options: beans, beer, or both. Uh, okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it might seem like a tip, but let's not. Beans, beer, or both. The place is called Opa. Opa. Uh, beer? That's right. It's both. No, the options oh, are beans, right. beer, or both. I know, but it is. Beer. No, if there's an is option. Is it because you can make beer from beans? Is that, I mean, I don't even know if that's possible. You mean, you but... It's mean, coffee, like coffee, coffee, coffee beans. Beer. Sorry, oh, okay. sorry. Okay. Is it a craft? Yeah, I, did, I forgot my whole bit. Is it craft <laughs> brew of coffee or craft, craft brew of beer? But in uh, the name of thinking globally, we uh, in, in our pregame, we were talking about India uh, there's a place in, in Mumbai called Opa, um, a bar and cafe at the Peninsula Grand Hotel, which looks oh. like an amazing place, uh, the Peninsula Grand Hotel uh, in Mumbai. But um, but yeah, there's a place there called Opa that looks like it has lovely coffee and beer. So I will have to visit. Do it. <laughs> well, sweet. Um, so again, Urvashi, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I can almost always say, because you're not allowed to have one favorite child, that I want to enjoy and continue the conversation um, socially with all of our podcast guests. However, um, if you're in Chicago, let us know, because I want to hang out. Um, but anyways, thank you for joining us on the ESG Experience podcast. There's a new episode every month. So if you enjoyed your time with us, please subscribe on your favorite podcast directory. We do appreciate our loyal subscribers for continuing to listen and support mm -hmm. our podcast. Um, all 50,000 of them. Very appreciated. That's um, um, podcast washing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you do want to continue the conversation between episodes, follow us on your favorite social media channel at hashtag ESG experience. Catch you next time. Thank you, Ravashi. Very nice to meet you. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. Thank you.